So good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to IGTV. Uh, we have with us this morning uh, the InfraGuard editorial brought to you by William H. Murray. All right, and uh, Bill is live on the screen now. He's going to be talking about security lessons learned regarding WikiLeaks. Why don't you take it away, Bill? Morning, Joe. I'm an advocate for transparency and accountability in government. I believe the bureaucrats and politicians routinely abuse secrecy to avoid embarrassment and to cover incompetence. That said, there are legitimate reasons for secrecy. For example, secrecy is often essential to gaining necessary cooperation from intelligence sources and from other states. Government has an obligation to keep its secrets. When government fails to keep its secrets, bad things happen. For example, for the last three decades, this government has done such a terrible job of protecting sources that we can only repeat the naive and the ignorant. When government fails to keep its secrets, the fourth estate, by default, has an obligation to publish. First, publish is what they do. Second, a free press is essential to a functioning democracy. Third, when the government fails to keep its secrets, equity requires that everyone, particularly the average citizen, have equal access to the compromised data. Of all the players in the WikiLeaks tragedy, my sympathies are with the press. They are in a difficult position, but I prefer that they publish too much rather than fail to publish something that is essential to holding the system accountable. I like the stated policy of the New York Times with regard to publishing compromised state secrets. They, they assert that they redact sources and that they do not publish anything that would harm national security. However, as security professionals, the issue for us is preventing the disclosure in the first place. There are lessons for us in the run-up to these leaks. My colleagues who are career national security professionals remind me that the pendulum swings from protecting security to exploiting intelligence. After the Walkers, we restricted clearances. After Hansen, CIA would no longer share with FBI. After George Herbert Walker Bush shared with Gorbachev, NSA would not share with anyone. However, since 9-11, the pendulum has swung the other way. First, need to share as Trump need to know. For example, according to the New York Times, PFC Bradley Manning had access to hundreds of thousands of classified documents, thousands of those classified secret. How could anyone have need to know the contents of so many documents? Permit that kind of access and leaks are the inevitable result. Second, the focus of security has shifted from insiders to outsiders. Again, for example, and according to the New York Times, Manning was only one of a million with his kind of access, some of them even younger and with more time on their hands than he. If young Manning leaked information to WikiLeaks for ideology, how likely is it that there are none leaking to other nations for money? Such access makes leaks all but inevitable. Third, we have granted clearances to too many people and have investigated them poorly. However much money there is for background checks, there is a finite number of trained and experienced investigators. Spread them too thin, people will slip through, and leaks will result. Fourth, government is systematically overclassified partly out of bureaucratic habit, sometimes for political reasons, and partly because the cost of protection is borne by the user, not the classifier. There is no penalty to the classifier for saying this document is top secret. He's not going to have to pay all of the procedural costs that will result from that. At least partly as a consequence, we underprotect leaks of the inevitable consequence. Note that while the leaked documents in WikiLeaks appear to be embarrassing, and while the leaks will inevitably make recruiting more difficult, 
few of the documents required or deserved exceptional protection. As much as some national security types resist the idea, classification is an economic decision. It may not be a decision about the value of the data, or even about the value of preserving its secrecy, but it is a decision about the cost that one is willing to incur to protect the data. It is a decision about how to allocate scarce, in some, in some cases finite, security resources. We protect data at the expense of the data that we do not protect. Finally, we are relying on the integrity of people because they are cleared instead of because they are being monitored and supervised. According to the Times, only half of the computers in SuperNet are even equipped to monitor users for unusual access, and far fewer than those are actually supervised. The Bush administration abused intelligence sources and distorted the security culture. WikiLeaks is the inevitable result. The pendulum will inevitably swing back, but we have to be sure that we keep it on an even keel. For example, since the alleged leaker is alleged to have copied the data to a CD that he pretended to be listening to, DOD has, has ordered the removal of CD drives and USB ports. This is going to prove to be about as effective as forbidding the use of earphones. The real direction is fundamental, if not obvious. We must classify view, fewer documents and limit access to those that we do. We must limit access that insiders have, hold them accountable for the access they use, and use them to protect us from the outside. We must clear fewer people and investigate, monitor, and supervise them better. We must do all of this while reforming the culture. Now, there are no surprises in this list, no silver bullets, no magical expectations, just hard work. Please don't whine about how hard this is. Do not complain because it is difficult. Do not even mention that there will still be leaks and that we will still be blamed. That is why we are called professionals and are paid the big bucks. See you next week. Great editorial, Bill. Thank you.